Hello, welcome to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB Reading Series. Fantastic Fiction is a monthly speculative fiction reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month, hosted by Ellen Datlow and me, Matthew Kressel. We spotlight well-known and up-and-coming science fiction, fantasy, and horror authors, and admission is always free. We publish a monthly podcast and video so people who can't attend the in-person event can still enjoy the readings. If you'd like to support the series, you can donate at kgbfantasticfiction.org slash support. Anyway, on to the show. How are you good? All right. We're going to get started this evening tonight. How is everyone? I didn't, I didn't hear that. How is everybody? All right. Welcome to Fantastic Fiction at KGB. My name is Matt Kressel. I co-host the series with Ellen Datlow. It is held on the second Wednesday of every month, and it is always free. There is no cover charge. All we ask is that you buy a drink, hard or soft, and tip your, tip your bartender. Kelly is working hard to keep you hydrated. Let's give a round of applause to Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Kelly's working uh, alone tonight. She's working really hard, so yes, keep those, keep those tips flowing. Thank you, we appreciate that. Um, so, uh, I have some, some sad news. I think some of you have heard uh, that Terry Bisson died. Uh, if you don't know who he is, Terry Bisson was a great writer. He was the co-founder of this reading series that you all are now at, this fantastic fiction reading series in the late 90s. He co-founded it with Alice Turner. Uh, Alice was uh, the fiction editor for Playboy magazine. And uh, for those who don't remember, actually, uh, some of the best fiction, short fiction in the, in the world was published uh, in English in Playboy. So uh, they started the series together and um, I, I literally wouldn't be here today without Terry. I didn't, I didn't know Terry well, but um, I took a writing class at the New School in 2002. Uh, at that time, it was Terry's class. Terry had started the class, but at that time, Alice Turner, who was the co-founder of the series, took over. Uh, after the class, uh, Terry and Alice introduced me to the people who are part of my current writing group, the Altered Fluid Writing Group. If you don't know that writing group, N.K. Jemison is a member, Sam Miller is a member, Elia Don Johnson is a member, uh, a lot of fantastic writers, Mercurio de Rivera, all these people are members. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't have met that, um, I wouldn't have met any of them with, without Terry's influence. And uh, yeah, the, and and this series uh, wouldn't exist without Terry. So let's uh, let's give Terry a, a round of applause. Just let's let's thank him for. Uh, and if if you haven't read his work, yeah, let's let's do a cheers if you have a drink to Terry. Terry. If you haven't read his work, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, and there was, um, I believe it was last year, there was a New Yorker article discussing his life and work. So thank you, Terry. Uh, our readers tonight are Eric Schaller and P. Jelly Clark. Uh, super excited to have them both here tonight. Where's, where's Ben? No, 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 oh, there you are, all right. I was like. My drink's over here, so I want it. That's all good. Um, do you want to do the upcoming readers, or should no. I do it? Okay. Uh, our first reader tonight is Eric Schaller. Eric, Eric's latest collection of dark fiction, Voice of the Stranger, contains stories selected for fantasy, best of the year, best of the rest, and the year's best weird fiction. His fiction can also be found in his collection, Meet Me in the Middle of the Air, and in many anthologies and magazines. His stories are influenced in part by his studies in the biological sciences and the uneasy relationship humans have with each other and the world around them. Please welcome Eric Schaller. Um, 
So many thanks, uh, Ellen and Matt, for giving me this opportunity to share some of my work with you this uh, evening. And it's amazing to see just how many people are out here. It's great seeing this po post-COVID what's going on. Um, so I've got a couple short stories to read, one shorter than the other. Um, but before I started, I want to mention, yeah, so I come from the far, far off northern climb of New Hampshire, where we actually do get some snow, unlike down here in New York, as I understand it. Um, but I love coming to the city. Um, but this time my coming is a little bit bittersweet um, because in the past, what I would always look forward to was getting together with Rick Bowes. Um, Rick Bowes is another one of the great writers we lost recently on uh, the day of New Year's Eve. Um, and he wanted to, so we'd usually get together in a cafe or a deli and just chat. Uh, Rick loved to talk and share his adventures. Um, and I'll say what one, everyone should read is his collection, Dust Devil on a Quiet uh, Street, which is really almost a um, song, um, hymn to New York City and what he knew of it. Um, and it's really a collection of stories, but again, it becomes something larger than a collection. And he was sort of amazing because he had a very interesting life and he could take most of the life and put it into a short story and just add one tiny twist to it to make it something a little bit more magical or fantastic. Um, anyway, so I just want to, before I want to mention one of my last conversations that I had with him was soon after COVID hit. Um, and again, I'm up north in fairly rural areas. And I was at uh, my childhood home in Vermont. So again, there is dirt road, one house every quarter mile very different than New York City. But um, basically Rick lived, as he talked about, in the center of the universe, which is at the intersection of Bleecker and McDougal Street. <laughs> and he had a very small apartment, very, very small. Um, and so I was wondering, I basically called him up. I was basically, again, rural, grassy field around me. The main thing we had to worry about were ticks up there. Um, barefoot on the lawn and basically I called Rick up just to see how he was doing because I was concerned that he was in this tiny little enclosed space and couldn't get out and do anything but what he told me was that actually he could get out he said basically in many ways the streets were quieter than it ever been during pre-COVID and so he said he was able to take walks around all the sidewalks and everything and really just get out and about and so even though I often see him as talking about all these people and what's going on in New York City, in some ways his dust devil on a quiet street is how I can sort of see him at that time of COVID. So anyway, I would like to give a little toast to uh, Rick Bose. He used to sit right over here. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, two short stories. Um, my stories are often called disturbing, this one is one of the least disturbing I probably have ever written. Um, I often consider sort of stories potentially having a happiness quotient associated with them. And this one I'd say the happiness quotient is about 80% in terms of how well things turn out for people involved in this story. Um, so this is three urban folk tales. I partially wanted to choose this as well because it relates to the urban environment even though I live far away from it. But it was inspired in part by my summer after high school when I lived in the city with my uncle and aunt. So three urban, fo urban folk tales, and again, so there's three of them, they each have their own part. The first is called The Postman. There was a postman whose father was a postman and his father a postman before him. Like them, the postman wore a blue-gray uniform with a stripe down the pants leg, and like them, he delivered mail on six days out of the week resting on Sunday, as was the tradition. Times change and traditions change, and many of the postman's brethren took to wearing running shoes. Some even wore spikes so as not to slip on the icy winter sidewalks. But the postman still wore black leather shoes and polished these to a high gloss before he went on his rounds each morning. The postman walked most of the time, but at a pace that made the pedestrians seem statues frozen in mid-stride, he a breeze sliding amongst them. 
Over the years, he came to know his postal route so well that he could predict under which awnings the birds would build their nests and the number of icicles that would descend from any given rain gutter. He could have walked his route blindfolded. He even did this once uh, at night when the entire city was dreaming just to prove to himself the possibility and did not stub a toe. When your feet know the path, then your mind is free. And so the postman was never bored, whistling a tune as he walked that put the birds to shame. One day the postman found that road work had begun on the street adjoining an apartment building to which he delivered the mail, along the route that he normally followed. Large machines now tore the street apart and other machines layered asphalt and tar, all under the supervision of men in uniforms. Furthermore, a tape of orange plastic with the words, no trespassing, blocked his path. He approached the tape and touched it with his right hand. A man dressed in blue and wearing a yellow hard hat called out to him. Can't you read? The man said. The question did not invite an answer. The postman was bound by his code of employment to deliver the mail, and so he decided to follow another route to the building, one of which he had heard but previously had no reason to use. The route he chose was down a dark and narrow alleyway and was shorter than his normal delivery route. But as luck would have it, he was set upon by a pack of dogs just when he thought he had reached the door to the building. These bit him and ripped his clothes, then raced off taking the bag of mail with them. The postman did not know whether to follow the dogs or to run off in the opposite direction. He sank to his knees and wept, for he was a proud man and resolved to try yet another route. The next day he followed the alleyway where the garbage from the apartment building was stored. Officially the garbage was removed once a week, but at the time of this tale, the garbage collectors had been on strike for over a month and garbage overflowed to trash bins and accumulated in great mountains along the alleyway. The day was hot and the smell of garbage intense. The postman covered his nose with a handkerchief, but to no avail. He passed out from the odor, and while he lay oblivious, rats came from the garbage and took his mail to lie in their nests. On the third day, the postman returned to his former route, even though road work was still in progress. He ducked beneath the orange plastic tape that read no trespassing, passed between the machines that tore the road apart, and avoided the other machines that layered asphalt and tar. The men who supervised the machines called to him using profane names, but he blocked his ears and continued on. In this manner, he successfully reached the apartment building and delivered the mail. Nevertheless, his shoes had become so encrusted with tar that he was never able to scrub them clean. The second of the tales is called True Love. You will find your true love in this city. This is what the young girls of the country tell one another in hushed voices so that their parents do not hear. The girls make secret pacts, sealed with blood and kisses, to leave home together when they come of age. These promises, like most, are soon forgotten by all but a few. It is these few who leave the country for the city. They find jobs and apartments, cats to name after the favorite drinks, shortcuts to sushi bars, and parking places that no one else even knew existed but they never forget why they came to the city in the first place. There was a young woman who came to the city and to make ends meet took a job at a copy shop. A man came into her copy shop every day. He wore a gray suit and carried a black briefcase from which he would take the papers he had her copy. He barely spoke and was several weeks before she noticed him and several weeks more before she began to expect him. One day she saw that papers he gave her to copy were blank and then she knew that he was in love with her. Never let it be said that love is all in vain. The man found his voice, and soon they were both calling each other by pet names in public. A year flew by with walks in the park when the sun was out, and movies when it rained. In the evenings, they would eat at the woman's favorite sushi bar and try to guess the occupations of strangers that walked by. On weekends, they would buy discounted day of show tickets, park at a convenient spot the woman knew was always miraculously empty, and go to the theater. If love were simple, then this tale would be over. But one day, the man missed a date with a woman, and when she tried to call, she found that his phone was no longer in service. When she inquired around the city as to his whereabouts, she was only able to learn that he had quit his job and left with no forwarding address. She waited for a call or a letter from him. She invented reasons for why he might have gone. Sometimes she cried, and at other times she bellowed in anger. Still, he did not return. The woman decided that perhaps a man's heart is an open book, 
but if so, then it is written in an alien language. This is what she told her friends over drinks, and they laughed and said that the city was making her bitter. She said, no, just men. Not long after that, while she was in the lobby of her apartment building, she noticed the postman sliding envelopes into the rows of post boxes that serviced the apartments. She admired the calm efficiency with which he performed the task. Looking at his face, she realized that he was a young man, not much different from her in age. Glancing downward, she saw that his shoes were encrusted with tar. Because she had a kind heart, even if outwardly bitter, she invited him up to her apartment for a snack while she tried to clean the tar off his shoes. On the way up in the elevator, they began to talk, and they were still talking the next morning when the rising sun reminded them that they had to go back to work. So the woman found her true love in the city, and if the two are not divorced, then they are married still. Um, tale number three, which is called As Above, So Below. The city is not one city, but many. Beneath the city of men and women lies the city of the rats. The mayor of this city had a daughter who was considered entrancingly beautiful. She had dark eyes, long whiskers, a glossy brown coat of fur, and a pink tail that could circle her body twice around. Her father desired that she marry a lawyer, a banker, or a businessman, professions that in the city of the rats refer to those who steal, store, and exchange the food and trinkets that they value so highly. The daughter said that her husband could be as poor as a church mouse. She had but one requirement, that he not be boring. Many suitors came to win her hand in marriage. They performed acrobatics, acts of ventriloquism, sang songs, and danced. They did complex calculations in their heads based on any mathematical question she might ask. They guessed the identities of playing cards hidden inside a cereal box. Some, it is true, even had help from the mayor, who hired acting coaches so that his business partners might appear in a better light. But nothing worked. The daughter would eventually raise a small, well-formed paw to stifle a yawn, and the suitor would be dismissed. One day, a young rat came forward to beg audience with the mayor's daughter. He was not handsome, nor was he rich, but his eyes were bright and his paws were clean, as rats will say when they wish to say something nice about a poor relative. Moreover, the suitor said he would not entertain before the mayor's whole entourage, but insisted upon entertaining the mayor's daughter in private. You can guess that tongues began wagging at that. But the daughter, intrigued, reminded her father that she could more than take care of herself. The mayor did not answer. Indeed, he scowled at the suitor for a full minute. He then laughed, for truly the suitor was of such nature that he would have difficulty inspiring fear in a mouse. And that being the case, how could he ever inspire love in his daughter's heart? Once alone with the mayor's daughter, the suitor undid a large letter, still in its envelope, that he had been carrying. What is that, asked the mayor's daughter. This, said the suitor, his whiskers twitching, is a story from the city of men and women. The letter that the suitor read told of a young man from the country who fell in love with a beautiful country girl but could only admire her from a distance. Whenever he tried to approach her, his legs would turn to lead and hold him fast to the ground. Anytime she came near him, his tongue clove to the roof of his mouth such that he could not speak. Nevertheless, when she came of age and left home for the city, he followed her. There in the city, she, thinking that he was from the city, fell in love with him. He, playing the role of a man that she might love, found that he could finally talk to her. But although he did not initially realize it, he was trapped. He could tell her nothing of himself, only of this person that he pretended to be. So he had spun more and more lies as to who he was and what he did. Finally, sick of the lies, he had fled the city to go back to his home in the country. Now that he had finally told the truth in this letter, if she still loved him, she could find him there in the country. If not, he would never bother her again. The rat suitor folded the letter back along its original creases and returned it to its envelope. What happened next, asked the mayor's daughter. That, said the suitor, is another story. In the city of men and women, there are more stories than there are stars in the night sky or hairs on a healthy rat. Some stories are meant for a large audience. Some, like this one, were written for a single person. The woman for whom this story was intended never received it. And so you and I are the only ones who know it. But if you will invite me back for tomorrow, I will tell you another such story. 
yes to the mayor's daughter tomorrow and tomorrow's tomorrow and all the tomorrow's thereafter. If rats can marry, then they're married still. <laughs> And then one other very short story, essentially a piece of flash fiction, but a story nevertheless. Um, and this gets to my sort of love of automata. Um, and basically within my two collections of short stories, I'd say at least five involve automata of some nature. Um, this one is again very short, just called cabinet number 42. The cabinet door opens to reveal a tableau of four dusky figures, dolls arranged in a pattern approximating a circle. Then the music starts, a tinny waltz, and small lights come on in recessed alcoves to spotlight the figures. The figures begin to move, automata, and their movements serve to shrug the mouse-colored dust from their heads and shoulders. There is a gentleman in a tuxedo his wife in a blue ball gown decorated with ribbons and pearls, and a golden-haired girl wearing a miniature version of her mother's dress, and a chimpanzee dressed in the garish approximation of a servant's finery. The spectator watching this Lilliputian scene recognizes the faces of the three human automata. He has seen them before in the memorabilia left in other rooms of the house. The automata dance to the waltz, arms linked, but it soon becomes clear that they cannot keep up with the music. They shuffle and miss steps. Occasionally, they stop altogether as if confused, then start again but demonstrate no improvement in their control. Soon the mother is dragging her daughter along because she no longer makes any effort to move her feet. Then all four stop. They have given up. The woman reaches into the front of her dress and pulls out four white sticks. She holds these straws out in a bundle only the top ends exposed above her fist. The gentleman, the girl, and the ape reach out in turn, each withdraw one straw from her hand. The drawing completed, they hold up their straws for comparison to each other. The ape gets the short straw. The head of the ape droops in recognition and acceptance. He pulls open his green jacket and unbuttons his red vest to reveal the gears and wires in his chest. The three human automata each reach into his chest cavity and take a gear. They then tilt their heads back and open their mouths. Their mouths are much wider than their painted lips to swallow the gears. There is a metallic rattling as their mouths chomp up and down. The three human automata now return to the dance. Renewed, invigorated, they spin with feverish abandon, their feet leaving the floor of the cabinet on occasion. It seems that they will never stop. But stop they do eventually, although apparently out of pride rather than necessity. They stand side by side, facing the spectator, and bow repeatedly until the spectator shuts the door to the cabinet. Having shut the door, the spectator realizes they does not know what happened to the ape, only that it was not part of the final waltz. To resolve this mystery, he opens the cabinet again. He will watch the mechanism run its course, but this time he'll watch what happens to the ape after its gears are removed, rather than following the movements of the dancers. The music starts, the lights come on, but this time there are only three figures and the ape is not amongst them. The spectator quickly closes the door, but he still hears the muffled sound of the waltz continuing behind it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a 10 minute break now, have a drink, and we will be back in about 10 minutes. To the second half of Fantastic Fiction at KGB. Um, I started not wanting me to talk about Terry, but I, the only Terry stories I know are not re repeatable here. <laughs> No, 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 well, no, 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 it's, I've told people personally when we've been all been drunk and <laughs> chatting, but no, no, Terry was great, I can't drink anymore, give me some pot, no, sorry, <laughs> um, no, anyway, Terry was a great guy, I published him a lot, he was a really cool, um, he drank a lot, <laughs> and he was very silly when he drank sometimes, 
Um, and I haven't seen him in years. I mean, since he moved, he moved to San Francisco around 2002, I think. I looked it up, and I can't believe he was gone that long. Because he was like a fixture in New York. And he and his wife, Judy, ben Judy Jensen, had a fantastic house in Brooklyn. And I wanted that house. I said, if only we could move that house to Manhattan, I'd love to live here. <laughs> you know? And uh, they didn't. But they left the house, and they moved to San Francisco. They wanted to be near their grandkids. Uh, so that's why they moved. And I don't, I hardly ever saw him, you know, since then. Um, but I know he was a political activist, and he was smart, and he loved his kids, and I assume he loved his grandkids. I never met any of them. Um, you know, and he and Rick Bowes were, were people who were very important, and um, it's a bad time that a whole generation of around the same age were going. You know, so appreciate <coughs> the writers while you can people who mean a lot to you. Yeah. Anyway, um, first of all, Eric forgot to say that he has books for sale. And we could have, you could have bought them during the break, but now you, have to, you can buy them after the second reader. He had two of his collections, so please come and he will sign them to you. And you better, don't make him take them all home, so try to come and buy a few. Have another drink, and I'll, well, before you buy them, the books. Anyway, um, we have some upcoming readers are February 14th, we have Isabel Yap and Randy Dawn. <coughs> March 13th, we have Moses Osa Utomi and Christopher Rowe. April 10th, Jennifer Marie Brissett and Robert Levy. May 8th, Anya Johanna De Niro and John Wiswell. And uh, June 12th, Bracken McLeod and Gra Grady Hendricks. And those are definite, unless somebody cancels. You know, and others are going to be filled in as time goes on. <coughs> in the meantime, we, I am happy to introduce Fenderson Jelly Clark, <coughs> who is the award-winning and Hugo Nebula World Fantasy and Sturgeon-nominated author of the novels A Benny Song, is it pronounced A Benny? Yeah. And A Master of Gin, and the novellas Ring Shout, The Black God's Drums, and The Haunting of Tram Car 015. His short stories have appeared in online venues such as Tour.com, which is now going to be called Reactor. Reactor. It's like, I'm gonna say don't like ask, Reactor. don't ask. <laughs> we just found this out yesterday. Um, it's so like anyway. a Max HBO thing. Like, <laughs> well, because Except they wanted to say more syllables. Well, because Lit Reactor went under so they figured they could take the name. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Um, I work for them, so I can't say anything. <laughs> Keep my mouth shut. You might want to edit that out. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <coughs> and in print anthologies, including Hidden Youth and Black Boy Joy, and Black Boy Joy, and you're also you're also in the um, the Jordan Peele anthology, which I don't remember the title of, which is out. Thank which you. Which I'm reading. Ah. 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 <laughs> his, his upcoming novella, The Dead Cat Tale Assassins, will be out in 2024. Please which I'm also welcome. reading from. Yes, so please welcome him. Everybody, everybody can hear me? Everybody, this is on? Okay. I get nervous speaking in front of crowds. No, I don't. I teach for a living. <laughs> so anyway, uh, hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, New York. Good to be back. So um, I lived in New York a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, back then, I used to come here. My boy Kirk over there. Hey, Kirk. I uh, used to come here to watch other writers do this and say, one day, Maybe I'll be up there doing this. <laughs> and I got that chance a while back uh, when I was first invited here, and I got to read a story that was then unpublished. Everybody got, this was the first place I'd ever read it, and it was the introduction to the story uh, Ring Shout, uh, the novella Ring Shout, which ended up doing a lot better than I thought. Now, a whole lot of stuff happened in between then, because I remember after going to that, I think we went to eat somewhere, and I was talking to someone, and they were like, you heard like there's this virus or something like way out there and it might get here. And I'd be like, what do you want to do with sci-fi films? What are you talking about? Uh, literally a few weeks later, yeah, uh, it all hit. And so that's my memory <laughs> to bring everybody down. That's my memory of my last time here. So it's great to be back now uh, for those of us who made it through all of that, uh, for those of us who didn't. 
Uh, it's great to be back. Uh, it's great to be able to read with everyone here um, and to be able to share some new stories with you guys. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank for the folks who came out. I want to thank Cassandra for coming out. Literally, I didn't tell anybody about this. I'm sorry. I'm terrible at advertising. <laughs> I'm horrible. So I sent it out this I morning. I, found out. I, sent, I sent it out this morning. Cassandra's like, well, I'm going to be there. And I was like, from Queens? <laughs> When I lived in New York, like, I lived in Brooklyn, somebody said Queens. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm not coming out there. <laughs> it's far. And so I can't imagine. You came from Queens. That's, that's a commitment. That's like coming from Jersey. And so that's a, that's a commitment. Thank you. I'd um, like to thank uh, my cousin, Carl, who came out here. When I moved back to New York in the early aughts, I actually lived with Carl. And here's the thing about Carl. Like, um, I did not know him my entire life <laughs> until we were in our 30s. But then I ended up coming to New York and living with him, and it turned out his mom says, here are all the pictures of you guys when you were babies. <laughs> <laughs> and my parents, his parents used to live literally in the same place, and they would babysit each other, and we're like, so we met each other, and we're both trying to feel each other out, like, who is this dude? Like, how do we know each other? And we start talking, and he starts, and somehow we start talking about comic books. He's like, you like comic books? I said, yeah, I like comic books. You like them too? <laughs> and then we find out we have other interests, like, oh, you like politics? Yeah, I like politics. <laughs> And so we just got into it, and Carl, would, Carl was the guy who could get me into any club and meatpacking district. He, like, knew everybody, right? He'd just go up there and talk. When I would try to go there without Carl, they'd be like, who are you? Why do you think I, I know you? I said, I know Carl. Who is that? And I was like, you know who Carl is. He's the dude who gets us in. Carl would get us into these clubs. Then we'd go to, this is for old New York here. We'd go to, what, Seven A's? I think it's gone now. Anybody remember Seven A's? We'd go there for eat breakfast, like, at 2 in the morning. Then somehow we'd end up at... Moe's in Brooklyn, the old Moe's in Brooklyn, not whatever they did to it now. And then we'd uh, go to sleep and somehow wake up in time to watch McLaughlin report. This is, this is how old it was. Remember that? Bye-bye. Remember that guy? That's what we would do. That's, that's, that's how we got down. And so thank you for coming out. Uh, great to see you here. Kirk, met Kirk um, actually in one of the first places I was published, an indie book called Griots, which is this book of African uh, fantasy and speculative fiction. We met each other, uh, we hung out. What was that spot that we hung out in Brooklyn? Uh, the beer spot. The, uh, Schwartz uh, Cologne or something? Yeah, the Schwartz Cologne, this German beer garden. Uh, we hung out there, we just got to know each other really well. We go hang out, remember that tea lounge? That's gone now, the tea lounge in Brooklyn. We go hang out there and do writing. And we just always talk, and it was Kirk who always said like, take your story to the next level. I'll always remember that advice you gave me. You were like, that's a good story, but take it to the next level, and I took that to heart. So thank you guys for coming out uh, to support me, and thanks for everyone else. So today, um, dropping my phone. Whoops. More where that came from. That's the Basil Hayden talking. So <laughs> today I'm going to read a bit from uh, this anthology that I got published in called Out There Screaming, uh, done by the Jordan Peele. Yeah, when Jordan Peele says, would you like to be an anthology, you say yes. <laughs> and you find something to write. Uh, this anthology of black horror. And so I'm going to read to you a bit from this short story called Hide and Seek and try to time myself. My little soliloquy there in the beginning doesn't count as time. I'm going to try to time myself. Don't worry about time, man. Don't worry about time. Okay, good, good, good. So let me make sure I start my stopwatch. My, my, I'm sorry, my kids have gone through this. Let me tell you something. I used to have all these ideas of how I would write and get stuff done and then I had twins. <laughs> and they were actually kind of cool when they were smaller and they were just spitting up and they couldn't like hold their heads up and I could just do stuff. Now, they're five. They can get in and out of things. They can reprogram your phone. They will always bomb all of your Zoom meetings at all times, right? And so it's, it's been, a, it's been a, the struggle has been real, but it's great to have them as well. And, it's, and I don't get to put them to bath, bed tonight, so yay, <laughs> it's time off. All right, so. The story is called Hide and Seek. Mama shakes and spasms, her willowy limbs twisting and jerking in a strange dance as her eyes flutter like butterfly wings. Ringlets of dark hair lay slick with sweat across her cheeks, so it looks like she's wearing a black veil. And the veins on her neck are swelled up like worms trying to burrow out of her skin. I can see her chest moving up and down, fast as a jackrabbit's. Her lips long done, long done gone blue, and she lies sucking in air like a panting dog. I stand there watching, the rifle on my shoulder growing heavier with each passing moment. 
Jamie sits cross-legged on the floor, bored, staring, his green eyes round as dinner plates. Neither of us says a word, instead following the lines of scarlet creeping across Mama's pale skin. They remind me of the vines that grow up around our house, but thin as threads and burning so bright, you can see them beneath her pretty saffron dress. Somewhere near, maybe another room, we can hear Daddy's whimpering. It'll just get louder, we know until it's a wail that makes your belly knot up and want to turn inside out. I close my eyes, fearing I might drown under it all. God, I think, maybe the, for maybe the hundredth time, I fucking hate magic. <laughs> but let me start at the beginning. One, two, three, Mama yells. You better be hiding. We run through the house, stopping at the brown shiffer robe in the kitchen. I know, a shiffer robe don't belong in a kitchen but that's kind of the point. I glance to the blue mark painted on the door before pulling it open. Get in. Jamie hesitates. It's kind of small. Four, five, six. Mama again. You're kind of small, I shoot back. Now get in. Jamie looks up at me, those big eyes filled with worry. He doesn't like tight spaces, but we ain't got much choice. You want this one to yourself, I ask? I could find another, no. Jamie squeaks before hopping up into the shiffer robe. Being alone during these drills terrifies him, enough to break through any other fears. Seven, eight, nine, I jump in after him, taking care to hold onto the rifle strapped at my back. Inside, I pull the door shut, closing us in stifling darkness. Ten, Mama yells. Ready or not, here I come. I will myself to breathe easy and settle back. The shiffer robe is old, maybe as old as this house. The wood has a musty smell to it that comes, that, that comes only with age. You can get a splinter if you ain't careful, and there's dust enough to make you choke. Jamie's pressed up against me. I can just make out his eyes intent on the bit of daylight peeking from beneath the shiffer robe door. Outside I hear footsteps making their way through the house. Something heavy is being dragged across the floor downstairs. Something else lands with a thud. Our hunter is searching. Now the footsteps head upstairs, then silence. I release a relieved breath. She's stumped. We're doing good. I glance over to give Jamie a reassuring smile, but it fades when I see his face twitching like he has an itch. He has to sneeze. Damn it. Outside, the footsteps return, slower, thoughtful. Jamie inhales and cups a hand to his mouth, I cover it my own, with my own silently, pleading with him to keep quiet. He looks up like he wants to say he's sorry before squeezing his eyes shut. The sneeze is muffled beneath our hands. Still, it seems to echo in the small space. And that's enough. Shit, shit, shit. The footsteps move closer, directly for us. They hesitate for a moment. Then there's the sound of something tracing along the door before finding the lock. Jamie's little fingers dig into my arm. I hold him back. We both hate this part. Now I'm gonna need your help here. Okay, there's a part here where mama says boo and I need y'all to say boo as crazily as you possibly can, right? So I'll tell you when. I'll count on three when I say it. The footsteps move closer, directly for us. Oh no, no, I already did that part. All right. Mama flings the shiffer robe open, her dark eyes glaring at us as she screams, one, two, three. Boo! That's what I need, that's right. Her face is contorted into a frightening mask and I rear back, flinching. Jamie squeals, his little body trembling. Mama doesn't stop, though. She won't, not until she's scared him shitless. Catching hold of myself, I stare at her squarely. Enough, Mama. I think he gets it. She stops, eyeing Jamie as if only now noticing his fear. There's a flicker of sympathy, then it's gone, her face hardening. She rounds on me. What happened? How'd I find you? A sneeze. It's dusty in here. Then clean it, she spits back. He's your responsibility, Jacob. You're older, keep him quiet. Her eyes shift to my rifle and her voice drops, unless you're ready to use that. Yes, ma'am, I mumble. I wanna ask what she possibly fucking knows about responsibility. He's a, he's a mouthy kid. <laughs> she exhales slow, and just like that, her whole face changes, turning calm as water. The two of you get something to eat, new face mama says softly. After that, we start up again. She walks away a long dress with flowery patterns swishing around her slender legs. I turn to Jamie, who still hasn't released his grip. A part of me is disgusted, 
hard enough looking out for myself. How am I supposed to take care of him too? But seeing the fear in his eyes banishes my sourness. Jumping down from the ship robe, I extend a hand. He clenches it but doesn't move, still curled into a ball in a corner of the small space. Takes me nearly half an hour to coax him out. This is hide and seek, and it's not a game. Should I go on? Yeah. Okay, all right, go on. All right. Blink, we're doing a different scene now. And when I say blink, that's what I do for a different scene. <laughs> I should do like the old diddle -di diddle -di thing <laughs> back in the day. When I'm doing <laughs> Mom is standing by the window in the old sitting room, her arms crossed and start staring outside. She'll stay like that, as still as a statue, waiting and watching the winding road from our house. Jamie is pointing excitedly at a commercial with David Hasselhoff and Kit from his favorite show, Knight Rider. Both warning kids to say no to drugs. I'm not sure what a talking car knows about drugs, but I nod every now and then, one eye on the TV, the other on Mama. She's wearing her nice red dress today. We don't get too many visitors, and she only gets like this when she's expecting a certain one. There he is. I turn to find Mama's no longer catatonic. She's almost giddy now, focused on an approaching truck in the distance. It's an old model, more curving than the newer ones. Might have been white once, but now it's covered with rust. It rolls up to the front, stopping right on top of the overgrown grass that's wilted to a dull brown in the autumn cold. The door creaks open and a gray snakeskin boot steps out. Oh no, you want to dun 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 when you see that. <laughs> Followed by another, I grimace, Sugar Man. I wonder, by the way, his name was first Candyman, but as you can imagine, the folks at uh, Jordan Peele <laughs> yeah. said you might have to change that name, so I came up with Sugar Man instead. Yeah. Sugar Man's real name is Wayne. Claims his name is Redfoot, and he likes to tell people he's a Choctaw. But I've never seen a Choctaw with dirty blonde hair and blue eyes before. Sugar Man, I'm trying to keep with the mic. Sugar Man sways more than he walks in his faded jeans and matching jacket, complete with a straw cowboy hat and a red checkered shirt. Seeing Mama at the door, he flashes a grin with too many teeth from behind the shaggy beard. The two of them embrace and carry on like old friends, but don't be fooled. This is business. Catching sight of us, he whoops a greeting and reaches into his jacket, taking out two bright wrappings. He waves them before us like you do to a dog before tossing a treat over. I catch one, my brother gets the other. We mutter thanks, and he smiles as if he's some good Samaritan before turning back to Mama. The two drop the old friend eye and get down to haggling. What you got? What you need? What's hot? How much can you drop? Junk's that much? Better not be no bad shit. I don't deal no bad shit, baby. That's why my junk ain't cheap. Guaranteed to make you fly, cooking up a new batch right now. Have it to you by Friday if you can pay. Mama licks her lips hungrily, nodding. Friday then. Sugar Man grins a wolf's grin, looking hungrier. I turn away, snatching the candy from Jamie's hand to throw it into the trash. Oh, didn't I tell you? Mama's what they call an addict. Blink. Let me introduce you to our house. It's called Deacon. That's the name written over the front door. We're DuCants now, but the house kept the name Mama's father gave it. I didn't know Grandpa Deacon all that well. He died when I was six. Jamie was just a baby. I remember the first time I saw this house, though, a big hulking thing with peeling paint and a creaky wood in the middle of nowhere. It looked alive then, with windows like eyes and a door big enough to swallow us whole. I half expected to fall down a giant gullet when I walked in. But instead, there was this wiry man with a crinkly skin, pale and thin as an eggshell. He had a sharp nose and a thin mouth that looked cut into his face and wore a bright red coat over a dark suit. A black hat was perched atop his head with a green feather tucked into the side as he'd sat in a grand chair of twisted metal that seemed too big for his bony frame, glaring at his returned daughter and grandsons. So, these the little half-breeds. Those were the first words I remember from him. No, hello. No, where have you been, Julia, for the past seven years? No kind grandfatherly smile and a coin behind the air trick like you see on TV. Instead, he took in our cashew-colored skin and thick curly brown hair. Jamie's eyes, though, surprised him. Father's a half-breed, too, then, he asked. Guess that makes you two quarter-breeds. There was a cackle then, a dry, raspy thing that made my scalp itch. Seeing my set face, his laughing faltered. He cocked his head to the side, staring at me like an old crow. 
And I realized then, unlike Jamie, I'd gotten his and mama's eyes, black as poppy seeds. He seemed to notice this as well, and his thin lips twisted into a smile. Blood is blood, though, he drawled. And just like that, we were welcomed in his home, the place mama had grown up and where she'd run from, only to return. I asked her about that once. She just sighed and shrugged, calling herself a tossed about boomerang. But who tossed her, I asked. She didn't answer. Living with grandpa was a big shift from the cramped rooms we called home. The house was bigger than anything I'd ever seen, and I loved to explore, explore it. Back then, Jamie was too small, so I had to do it on my own. It was in my wandering that I found grandpa's private places, where he met the people that came and went so often to the house. Men and women walked in on foot, drove in on broken down heaps, and were even chauffeured up in fancy cars. Sometimes they left their kids out to sit with me. They were the ones who explained it. Grandpa was a witch, or a hoodoo man, or a conjurer. All of them said something different. Whole deacon family came from magic, they said. Dark magic, summoned from the infernal powers and bargains made with elder things that live in the shadows beyond our world. Most people were afraid of them but they always needed his help with something or another. Silly things like love potions and important things like money. Sometimes they came for worse purposes. One girl claimed a swarm of locusts that had ate up acres of crops one year had been his doing. So was the freak swarm of frogs that had buried alive a state senator's main rival in his own car right before election day. Another kid said grandpa went digging in graveyards at night, snatching up the souls of people who wronged him. The deacons had gotten richer from their dealings, and Grandpa was able to build this big house, way out here, away from everyone. It sat up on a hill like a castle out of a story, making all the townspeople climb up to see their wizard. I think he thought that would make them respect him, but when he died alone and slumped in his big metal chair, no one had come to his funeral. The only person who showed up was an old black man who owed him money, said he wanted to settle debts to make sure old deacon didn't set no hints on him. We walked back home in the rain from the burial, Mama for some reason not wanting to take a car. The next day, a lawyer showed up to read Grandpa's will. He'd left all his money to some library in, in a far off place in Eastern Europe, the house he left for Mama. I sometimes think he did it just to keep her here, knowing his monstrous home would swallow her up. And that's why I'm going to stop. That is Hide and Seek, along with a lot of other great stories by authors from N.K. Jemison to Nairi Du uh, here in Jordan Peele's book. I don't like. I need to, I need to <laughs> pub Jordan Peele's book, but here it is. All right. Um, so uh, that being said, I need to. I need. Where's my drink? Here it is. All right. So I'm going to read to you from what is only an arc right now of a book that is supposed to come out in March. Knock on wood. <laughs> it is uh, switching up. This is fantasy. It is uh, novella. Uh, coming out from Tor, Reactor, it seems. <laughs> and so it is my return to fantasy. And I got to say that fantasy has always been my first love when it comes to writing. And it's weird because I've done well doing alternate history stuff that has fantasy elements and, you know, um, horror stuff. But you go to my library and it's like Robert Jordan, Wheel of Time for Days, every version. <laughs> Right? Um, fantasy is what I loved. I, you know, I still ha I have the old Bankin and Rass, or was it Rass, whichever it was, the old Rankin Bass, 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 Bass Hobbit, right? I, I can yeah. sing all those songs. Where there's a whip, there's a way. I know them all. <laughs> you know? I know Three Little Birds, the whole yep. thing. I know them all, right? Like, that, that's what I read. I, I read the Belgarian and the Melorian before David Eddings got problematic <laughs> when I was a kid. Right? I, I read about Dark Elves when that was problematic <laughs> to my small mind. I was like, so only the black ones are evil? Well, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, you know, so I love fantasy even with all the problems in it, right? Um, you know, I, I, sat, I read all of the books of Malazan, right? Book of the Fallen. And I would recommend them to no one because um, the trigger warnings in there, if I had to put them on paper, would roll down this podium, go out the door, and down the stairs. I cannot recommend them to anyone. But like a uh, fellow writer, Daniel Jose Older said, it is my guilty pleasure, right? I, I love fantasy. And so it's great to be able to return to adult fantasy in uh, this novella, um, The Dead Cat Tale Assassins. Um, the story itself uh, is about uh, an assassin who is dead. <laughs> what can I say? 
Um, as the saying goes, uh, it starts off here on a business card. Uh, the dead cattail assassins are not cats, so we get that out the way. Um, nor do they have tails, we also get that out the way. But they are most assuredly dead. Um, this is a secondary world fantasy. It is set in a city of my making. It, I pulled it from, imagine if I took a, a Eastern Africa Swahili city-state, melded it with ancient Greece and Angkor Wat and a few other things, and that's what we would have. So full secondary world, I just don't have two moons to certify it, right? This is not our world. Um, it is about this uh, assassin who is on the front cover named Avine. Um, as I said, I'm going to read the back. Avine, Avine, is skilled, uh, Avine is skilled, discreet, and professional, and here for your most pressing needs in the ancient city of Talabasi. Her guild is strong, her blades are sharp, and her rules are simple. Those sworn to the matron of assassins, a goddess by the name of Errol, uh, are resurrected, deadly, wiped of their memories, and have only three unbreakable vows. So we remember those. The first one, the contract for those to be killed must be just. No children, no one with child, no one who can be proven exactly innocent, right? Second, even the most powerful assassin can only kill the contracted. No freebies here. You can only kill those who are contracted, right? You can, now that means you can do a whole lot of things to people who aren't, but you can't kill them. Um, and the third and most important one, once you accept a job, you have to carry it out, or there is hell to pay, quite literally, with a very ticked off goddess. Um, and so where I'm going to read from is actually, I'm gonna start from the second part of the chapter, uh, of chapter one. Uh, we meet Avine in this earlier part. She's sitting and having dinner with her, one of her handlers who tells her about the job, kind of tells her a bit about her, her background, nothing, for writers, restaurants are great people to like do the info dumping and get, get that out the way. Do restaurants, people can talk about all kinds of things over a meal. Everyone can relate to it. Just a little trick there. And you get to talk about food. I, I, got, a, I got yogurt and ants, living ants in here. So you know, you get, you get spicy with it. Um, so she's sitting here, she's learned about the contract. Uh, she's got the business cards that one of her handlers just made. He's just made these new things called business cards. She thinks it's ridiculous, but she's gonna carry them around anyway. Uh, she's like, I suppose I'm, I'm going to give this to the people, leave it on the bodies of those who are dead so that people will know, hey, we did it. Um, she has also been given a coin, which is the find. It's how you find the person who has been contracted. And she's signed on to this contract, which has now ties her to the goddess that this, uh, that this job must be done. And so we meet her now in the second half of this first chapter, sitting out on the ledge. Oh, I should also say, it is a time of carnival in the city, right? Uh, it is the festival of the Clockwork King, the Pirate Prince, and the Golden Bounty, which you will learn about when you read the story. Um, so it is, imagine a festival that is a mix of Caribbean carnival. For those of you who've been to Eastern Parkway, you see a, a light version of it. <laughs> uh, Caribbean carnival meets Mardi Gras meets Brazilian carnival. It's, it's all of that, a mashup, right? And so she's sitting out on the ledge, waiting to go do her job at night. It was early night as a round moon cast its ghostly light down upon Talabisi. Even crouched atop a ledge on the tomb of the patriarchs, a blockish construction of top stone that housed the remains of the city's foremost ruling families. <laughs> Statues of the first 12 patriarchs were carved into its sides, long ago founders who had journeyed here to conduct trade. Talabisi had grown from a small outpost into a bustling cosmopolitan port where people from a hundred different lands settled. That history was written into the local pi pigeon, I can never say that, somebody say pigeon. Uh, pigeon, yeah, there we go. And etched into faces, both as blended as the city's hybrid cultures. From this high vantage, Avine could make out the crumbling lighthouse on Talabisi's eastern shore, which had once warned mariners of the rocky coast. Now it leaned like a nodding poppy piper in the abandoned smuggler's district. The entire region was illuminated by a cascade of light, what people still called the shimmer the clockwork king's lingering mark. To her immediate right were the central trading ports, where vessels of every conceivable make bobbed upon the waters. Single sail dows, larger galleons, and at least one gargantuan treasure ship, whose curving hull alone dwarfed them all. To the left of the ports was the financial quarter, with its pristine colonnaded banks and merchant houses in neat rows like stacked coins. Adjacent was the cleric's quadrant of temples, steeples, and spindly towers dedicated to a pantheon of divinities. 
but most in Talabisi lived here in the center, beneath the stone glare of the patriarch's tomb, what many still called the old city. An endless array of smaller structures illuminated by glow lamps that blinked like hundreds of eyes. Through the ages, buildings in the old city had been expanded or simply erected upon the bones of others. It was a mashup of ar architectural styles, stitched together to create a unique synthesis amid winding stone streets bearing names like the Butcher's Intestines or the Three-Eyed Way, and with districts from the upscale Fortunate's Widow's Row to the descending slums of the Wheelbarrow. Under terra un umber terracotta tiles made from local clay covered most rooftops, while others were capped by colorful rounded domes or draped in lush greenery. Weaved into this mosaic were shops and markets, gamblers' dens and funerary parlors, drinking holes and fine eateries, lavish homes and modest dwellings. Snaking canals crisscrossed it all, threads of tapestry traversed by curving flat-bottom boats whose dangling lanterns shone against the dark waters. Avine often perched here to take in the beautiful mess of it. The dead didn't require sleep, she tried, as liminal as the rest of her existence. She didn't mind it so much, only she wished she could dream. The way the living described it sounded intriguing. Maybe her dreams would be of her past life, or even of the dreams she once had. Dreams of dreams. Then again, the dead probably just dreamt of all the ways they possibly died, or a stifling dark oblivion. You're morbid tonight, she muttered. The only living things to hear her on this ledge were two stepper birds, like the ones she'd had for dinner. Little puffs of yellow that cheeped and hopped. They were flightless, and she had no idea how they'd got up here. But stepper birds were always about, found on every continent, as if they'd hopped their way across each one. I ate a few of your friends earlier. If you're smart, you'll stay up here, away from cooks and canal eels. The birds tilted necklace heads, eyes blinking, as if trying to decipher her prattle. Another bit of advice. Before you die, think over the cost of post-death employment. More blinking. Look at me. I must have been what, in my late 30th years when I kicked it? And I signed some infernal contract to work while I'm dead? Blink, blink. I've tried to figure it out. She tapped her temple. Racked my brain, puzzling at what kind of person would even do such a thing. But nothing comes up. Blink, blink, blink. Don't even know how I kicked it. Slipped and broke my neck? Drowned? Suicide? Mauled by a three-horned bull cat? Or what if I was shipped? Maybe I was some crime boss and got shipped only to come back as a vengeful assassin. A story like that should be a terrible. Escapades of a bean the eviscerator. Two short black beaks chirped, unimpressed. Yeah, well, what do you know? Shoo. She flicked at one, sending it careening off the ledge and plummeting like a rock. Wow, you guys really can't fly for shit. <laughs> the puff of yellow became a speck in the gloom. Sorry, that was uncalled for. The remaining stepper bird looked after his companion, then to her. I said I was sorry. Here. She laid down one of, the t one of Fennis's calling cards. You need somebody shipped? Look me up. Speaking of which, time to go to work. Reaching up, she pulled down her mask, a bone white cat with a feral grin. The stepper bird cheeped in alarm, hopped, and slipped off the ledge. A yellow ball tumbling into the dark. She sighed. That's life. Short. <laughs> I shouldn't, it's, it's, the, it's the basil. Um, she sighed. That's life, short and stupid. <laughs> Shaking her head, she snatched up the card, then hurled from the ledge to the rooftops below. There was weightlessness, the air flapping her cloak before her padded boots struck terracotta tiles. The, the height of the drop alone should have shattered her legs, but being an undead thrall had its perks, better than the fate doled out to unfortunate stepper birds. In a burst of speed, she crossed the sloping tiles without a sound. Masked revelers fed it in the streets below, unaware of the small figure that bounded from rooftop to rooftop. Up here, she might as well be a ghost. A sweet scent hit her nose, and not missing a beat, she zigzagged, swinging into an open window to flow like a silent breeze through a dark room. The woman intertwined with her two masked lovers never even glimpsed the shadow that snatched up a pastry, slipping back outside to crouch on the veranda. Shimmer cake. Yvine lifted up her mask and bit down, smearing her lips in white icing dusted in golden sugar. Her fingers, fingers plucked out the figurine inside, the pirate princess. 
Tradition held she'd have either chaos or fortune tonight. Maybe both, whatever the shimmer sent her way. She traded in her costume for work clothes, soft padded boots, black leather breeches, and a matching top. There was also the cloak, a thing of glimpses and shadows, with a hooded cowl to hide her face. As she ate, she looked down to a gathering procession, some in pirate princesses' costumes, set to reenact the march to the old smugglers' district to fight the clockwork king. Nearly everyone held a burning cane stalk. Others jumped to the music provided by a troop. They wouldn't actually go to the uninhabitable eastern shore, of course. Instead, the marchers would take a meandering road to the docks, dousing their torches in the sea. That is, if they didn't run into other bands along the way. Then there'd be challenges of recited literature and a chance of some real violence. Everyone was a little giddy, partly drink, partly the shimmer at its peak, churning out eddies of errant magic. Folks called that bacchanalia shimmer fever. There'd be lots of one-time trysts and babies conceived before the final night of festival was done, alongside brawls and deadly cutlass fights. People deal with memories of trauma in odd ways, she murmured, reciting Fennis. That's her handler who you would meet early on. Maybe she should try the same, not the cutlass fights, but when she was done here, she'd play the pirate again and try to lose herself in the night's festivities. Perhaps she'd even try Fennis' fermented sky bison milk. She made a face, or not. Finishing the cake, she tucked the figurine beside a dagger at her shoulder and set out again. She knew where she was going. The address she'd been given was guide enough, and the coin tucked into her belt pulled like magnetic ore. So it wasn't a surprise when winding streets gave way to greenery and terracotta roofs were replaced by towers capped in stone. One of the wealthy districts. Not the kind where mobsters and jumped-up trade magnets played at nobility. No, this was old wealth, well-aged like black sweet rum. She landed in the twisting branches of a tree laden with bulbous blood-red fruit, not native to Talabisi, so imported. Much of this garden looked to be part of a large estate, all stone arcways, pillars, and a flat roof with crenellated parapets like, small, like a small palace. Towers capped in white and closed each corner, and it was from one of them that the coin pulled. That explained all the guards. She hung upside down from the tree's branches, from this vantage, she counted at least 12 guards hovering about the base of her intended tower in red turbans and burgundy uniforms. Swords hung from their hips and the ivory hilts of long knives and pistols peeked from broad gold sashes. Hired help. She'd encountered this bunch before, the Iron Brotherhood or Ladies' Pride or some such thing. They always had stupid names. Then again, here she was a dead cattail, so maybe no judgments. One thing was certain. This wasn't your run-of-the-mill security detail. This was a mercenary company, ex-soldiers with the usual mix of leg breakers and whatnot to fill out the ranks. She'd wager Errol's right far <laughs> she'd wager Errol's fiery right tit they were protecting whoever she was meant to ship. And while she could possibly fight her way in, assassin ruled two number 240, oh, you're gonna get a lot of these in here, uh, said no assassin worth their blades actually sought out a fight. Where's that fortune I ordered, she whispered, rubbing the pirate figurine. The words had barely left her lips before she found it. Thick vines growing from the base of the tower, creeping all the way to the top. Riding herself, she dropped from the tree, moving fast in a low crouch. Once she brushed right by a patrol, and one guard spun about, looking straight at her. The cloak did its job, and his eyes slid off, searching for what he couldn't quite see. At a chiding from an impatient companion, he turned away. She reached the tower, pressing flat against the cool stone, clinging to shadows as more guards walked by. Peering up, her eyes passed four windows to land on one near the top, and the coin at her waist jumped, of course. Why was it people to be shipped never lived on the bottom floor, <laughs> even the middle floor? It was as if the fates had decreed killing should always take a good deal of climbing. Grabbing hold of the vine, she tested its strength a corded variety common to Talabisi, often treated with resin and turned into netting. Even like this, it was strong enough to hold her weight. Securing her footing, she started climbing, grumbling the whole while, all these guards, her job in the tower, like a bad fairy tale. More likely though, some power move, just you watch. She'd find a wheezing old geezer on his deathbed with a line of impatient heirs who'd set upon each other after his death. She'd best remember to leave a card. When she reached the window, it was open, 
Unsurprising, when days were warm and nights still cool, but she took it as more good luck and peeked inside. Her undead eyes didn't need adjusting, and though there wasn't any light, she could see the, the rounded room. There was one door, and best of all, no guards. She swung inside, padded boots landing on marble. The room was sparsely decorated, a giant vase in one corner, a black lacquered chest trimmed in gold against the wall, a divan with red and green pillows against another. What drew her eyes, however, was the bed pushed up near the back, a black laban wood fitted with four brass posts draped by a canopy. Behind the sheer cloth, a silhouette lay atop a mattress, chest rising with inhalations. She'd called it. Pull back that canopy and there'd be some shrunken little man with skin like cracked parchment. She drew her knife, one of two, with a black hilt and a dark curving blade long as her forearm. Both hummed in anticipation at the kill, bloodthirsty things. She'd make this quick, through the heart, then a slashed throat. If her luck held, she'd be in and out, undetected. Dropping her hood, she let her mask show. The last view before getting shipped, like a going away present. At the foot of the bed, she stepped aside, avoiding a chamber pot, the bane of assassins everywhere. <laughs> With one hand, she pulled back the canopy, knife raised, then stopped. Avine stared at a tranquil face framed by a thick long braids, the color of an azure dawn, a girl. The contours of slight cheekbones lay visible beneath her dark skin as oval-shaped eyes trembled in slumber and full lips parted to draw and release breath. Evine frowned. She knew this face. She recognized it, remembered it, but where? The loudest bell in the world rang inside her head. Not recognition, not remembering. This was a memory. Only she didn't have memories, not anymore. Well, you sure as fuck shit having one now. And what it told her, no, this was impossible. This face was impossible. A storm of emotion seized her. Disorientation, doubt, and one she'd almost forgotten. Fear. Dropping the canopy, she staggered back, foot stumbling on something. The stupid chamber pot, of course. It tipped over, mercifully empty, but it clattered loudly on the marble floor. The girl with the impossible face bolted upright, wide eyes searching until they found her. Then she screamed. And inwardly, Evine cursed. Errol's fiery fucking tits. Uh, Errol is her goddess, by the way, and that's a, a line she likes saying. That's where I'll stop. That was fantastic. So you said that's coming out in... In March. In March. All right. So, uh... Eric's got some books that you can buy and get signed and uh, come up, say hello to the authors, and if you have stuff to get signed, and please buy a drink. And uh, yeah, thank you all for coming, and, and we'll see everyone uh, next month. Thank you, and Happy New Year. Man. You have been listening to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB reading series. Check out our website at kgbfantasticfiction.org and click on support if you'd like to help keep the series going. Anyway, that's our show. Thanks for listening, and see you next month.